Probability distributions describe many commonly observed patterns in nature. There's the probability of the time until death, the distribution of wealth and populations, the probability that a distant animal is a friendly dog or a dangerous wolf. And today I'm going to argue that a few simple symmetries unify essentially all of the commonly observed probability patterns into a single conceptual framework, and that this unification provides significant insight into the way we interpret commonly observed patterns in nature. So let's start by just looking at some of the common probability distributions that we see along with their mathematical forms. And the usual way of describing probability distributions is by a narrative or story. You tell a story about a particular process, and then we get a mathematical form. So the Gumbel distribution is often called an extreme value distribution. And the story might be, we could measure the height of a river over the course of a year and take the extreme or maximum value in a given year. And then over a sequence of years, we would have a distribution of maximum or extreme values. And if we do that, we might often get the Gumbel form. And we can do some mathematics to show that that would be a reasonable form to get. The Gibbs exponential distribution, the common story for that, is that it's the distribution of energy levels for particles in a gas, or the waiting time for a random process, such as the time till a bee arrives at a flower. The normal distribution, or Gaussian distribution, we think of that as the aggregation or summation of a variety of random processes. The Rowley distribution, a story might be the wind velocity in a particular direction, and so on. So we have many narratives or generative processes, and each has its own probability distribution. And that's the usual way of describing probability distributions. But if you look at the mathematical forms, and I've done this for many years, and there's a lot of structure there, clearly, a lot of similarity. So the question is, can we understand that abstract structure more deeply? And if we understand that abstract structure more deeply, can we say something a bit more about how we understand commonly observed patterns? And that's what I'm going to argue today. But I want to start with the narrative approach because it's the traditional way of, of thinking about probability. So I'll start with cancer and describe a narrative generative process. And then we'll turn things around and look at the more abstract structure and look at the deeper structure of probability patterns. So these are data for colorectal cancer in the United States, solid line for males, dashed line for females. On the x-axis is age on a logarithmic scale. And on the y-axis is incidence measured on a logarithmic scale, where incidence is the number of cases per 100,000 individuals in the population in a given year at a given age. So 1,000 means 1,000 cases per 100,000 individuals. That's about 1%. So you can see the maximum rate gets close to 1%. And on this double log plot, we have a nearly a straight line. Okay. So I want to plot those data in a slightly different way because it'll be useful for us in understanding the structure of the pattern. So this same data, but what we're going to do instead is take an individual born at age zero and look forward from age zero into the future and ask what the probability distribution is for the time of cancer onset for colon cancer. So now we have a linear scale on the x-axis and a linear scale on the y-axis, the more traditional way of drawing a probability distribution. Okay, so we're looking forward and we're making the assumption that the only cause of death is cancer, so we can isolate the force of cancer. So looking forward through time, then these are the same data for individuals we might imagine, born in age zero, looking forward to getting the probability of cancer, colon cancer at any particular age. So those are data. If we extrapolate that curve to later ages, assuming the only cause of death is colon cancer, we can imagine what the curve might look like. It's an extrapolation, but I would argue that it probably looks like that. So the greener data, and the red is my extrapolation. So at age 240, you can see there's a small probability, but that doesn't mean the rate of cancer is low. What happens is the rate goes up and up, but your probability of living till age 240 is pretty small because you probably got cancer before that. Because now we're taking the point of view again of being born at age zero and looking forward as to when it is that you're going to get colon cancer as the single force. Now, if we isolate that curve as an idealized curve, that's a gamma probability curve. That's a classic gamma probability pattern, which is one of the most commonly observed probability patterns in nature. And the usual narrative story for a gamma probability distribution is that it's the waiting time for the nth event. So if we were to stand in the hallway and wait for the seventh person to go by, if they were going by randomly, that would be a gamma probability distribution. For cancer, the usual way of describing that 
is by the sort of multi-stage phenomenon. The idea is that when you're born, you have a variety of protective mechanisms that protect you against cancer, let's say six. So you have six things that are protecting you. And that as you get older, maybe three of those things have broken down, so you're in the third box, but you still have protective mechanisms, so you don't have cancer. You only get cancer when all your protective mechanisms have broken down, you land in that sixth or last box. So that's a waiting time process described in that way. Now we know that cancer is more complicated than that, but in fact, that process matches the data very well because in a gamma process, if we do a log-log plot of age versus time of onset, we'll get roughly a straight line with a slope equal to the number of steps minus one. So for six steps, we should get a log-log plot that's a slope of five. So it actually matches the data extremely well, that very simple narrative story. That's a narrative. Now let's look a little more deeply conceptually at what's going on, see if we can get the abstract structure. So we're talking about a failure process so far. We imagine on the top row there that that was what I showed you, that there might be six protective mechanisms and you get cancer when all of those things break down. And let's think about the scaling relation. When you're born, you have six protective mechanisms in place. What's the probability that you're going to get cancer in the next time increment? It's the probability that all six of those mechanisms break down simultaneously or nearly simultaneously. And the simultaneous occurrence of independent probability events you get by multiplying the probabilities. Multiplication goes with the logarithmic scaling. The log scale is the natural scale for multiplication. So at early ages in life, we have multiplication or a log scaling. Now, as you get older, one of those processes will break down. All of us have one or more of our processes have broken down, I can assure you. Um, but as you get older, you still have additional protective mechanisms left. And as long as you have a number of protective mechanisms left, you still have the probability of getting cancer in the next time increment as a multiplicative process, because you must have simultaneous breakdown of the remaining processes. Right? So we still have multiplication. We still have a log scaling. But eventually, you get very old, and either you're dead, or you have one step remaining. And this is effectively a linear process, because you just have this one probability remaining to determine the waiting time till cancer. So cancer then, or I would argue, or a gamma process, I would argue, is actually a pure expression of log linear scaling. That is, the scale changes with magnitude. Here the magnitude is age. This is very common in nature. Scaling relations are rarely logarithmic or linear, but they're almost always changing with magnitude. The gamma probability distribution is a pure expression of log linear scaling and actually nothing else. Now we could write the log linear scale mathematically. T will be our, what I call a natural metric for a problem or a scale. Z would be age in this case. If we write the mathematical expression as log Z plus alpha Z, when Z is small, the log term dominates. That's a log scale. When Z is large, the linear term dominates. That's a linear scale. So we have a mathematical expression for a log linear scale. That's the scaling. That's the mathematical form for the gamma probability distribution. You can look it up in any book. It looks like that. It's a product of a power law and an exponential. Now, if we write that mathematical form for the gamma probability distribution, it's e to the minus lambda t. We just find some t that matches so that we can write that way. It turns out that the t is the scaling relation, that log linear scaling relation. You plug the log linear scaling relation into this canonical form for probability distributions, e to the minus lambda t, you get a gamma probability distribution. So a gamma distribution is the pure expression of log linear scaling expressed in this canonical form. You can do this with essentially any continuous probability distribution. So this calls attention to the scaling relation. So this is a classic way of plotting a probability distribution standard, right? P of z, that's the probability of z. So that could be the probability of getting cancer at age z. Z is age, so that's just a linear scale, and that's the gamma curve. And that's the mathematical form for the gamma curve I just showed you, which I said we could write mathematically. We can always, essentially always write it as e to the minus lambda t for some t. Now notice we have an equivalence. We can notationally write the probability distribution as p of z. That's the normal way of doing it. But we can write it as e to the minus lambda t. It's the same thing. It's just a rearrangement of the terms. So there it's just notation. Now, if we plot the probability distribution as e to the minus lambda t, which is the same as just the probability I showed you before, but on the x-axis, we use the natural metric or scaling relation t 
then we just have a logarithmic expression, right? So we can do this again for essentially any continuous distribution. We just find the correct scaling relation and we draw it in this form. But the beauty of this form is that it expresses invariant probability per unit scale. By that I mean if we imagine some age z and we plot the age z in terms of its scaling relation t of z and we find its location and then we look at the height, that's the probability associated with the event z right there, that probability p. And if we take the probability that remains in the upper tail and call that u and we divide p by u, we get a constant lambda. And that's true at every point along this curve is exactly the same, p over u equals lambda. So this form defines a variant probability per unit scale. And this is one of the reasons why this canonical form is so powerful. So again, you can do this for essentially any distribution and it will reveal the underlying invariance or symmetry through the scaling relation T. So it calls attention to the fact that what we need to understand is the scaling relation T. Then one last background point here which is that if we, can, we draw the same distribution, but we use the square root of t, we get a normal distribution, right? So e to the minus lambda t plus or minus the square root of t, that's a Gaussian or normal distribution. We can do that for essentially any continuous distribution, and that reveals to us the deep unifying underlying structure of probability pattern, if we can only understand what t means. So far, I'm just describing the structure. Just for notice that it turns out that the average value of t on a scale of the square root of t, that's a generalized notion of the variance, which applies to any distribution, which describes the average distance of fluctuations from the peak relative to the square root scale. Okay, that's just a measure of Euclidean distance, right? It's basically a square relative to the square root of the squared values. So it's just the Euclid average Euclidean distance of fluctuations is a generalized notion of the variance, which applies to all probability patterns and gives us a much simpler and more powerful way of interpreting all of those crazy forms of probability distributions. So that says what we really need to understand are these scaling relations, right? I've just been invoking them, but let's just summarize a few of the commonly observed ones and then we'll go a bit more deeply. So we might say that T is just the underlying observation Z, a, a linear process, like a waiting time process, or it might be the square of the Z values, which would be true if you're looking at weights of individuals and populations. That turns out to be related to a notion of Euclidean distance, so the Z squared is just basically a measure of linear distance, Euclidean distance. The folding pattern of DNA, the distribution of wealth in populations tends to have this form, which is really just a linear log scale. It's linear at small values and logarithmic in the tail. This is an extremely common pattern in nature. The size of trees and forests across many forests throughout the world scales linear log linear, following this simple expression. Linear log linear is an extremely common pattern again and failure processes. How long is it before a jet engine breaks down? That sometimes scales linear log exponential. So just these and a couple more scaling relations will give us basically all of the commonly observed patterns that we see in nature. So it's very powerful. So now we need to understand what these T's are. So that's the first part of the talk. And I hope you can all see that there's potentially a possibility of understanding commonly observed patterns much more deeply if we could understand something about these scaling relations, these metrics. The second part of the talk is about the metrics. I'm going to show you that through symmetry, we can get a very deep understanding of those metrics. The second part of the talk is necessarily a bit more mathematical. Obviously, I don't have time to derive anything, but I'm going to show you the shape of the argument. So this is necessarily going to be rather quick. But we're going to try to give you a sense of where this deep structure comes from. So let's just start with the gamma probability distribution. I showed you that there's the mathematical form. That's the scaling relation that I argued was the description of the gamma distribution, a pure log linear scale. And that when we plug that into the canonical form for probability distributions, we get back the gamma distribution. And notice here we have a little notation. The standard way of writing a probability distribution, the probability of some event z, we're going to write that in terms of its natural metric. I'm just using that term. It's just a scaling relation. And that's what gives us this form here. So the probability from P of Z or E to the minus lambda T are, are the same probability as is F of T. They're all the same thing. And T is the invariant probability per unit scale. But this is what we have to figure out. If we're going to understand why probability distributions look the way they do, we have to know something about how to interpret T. So that's what we're up to now. 
So that's our basic notation. Now the first thing we can notice is that when we have an exponential form, that we can shift t by a constant and we don't change the probability distribution. Because t plus a just ends up multiplying this by a constant. We multiply a probability distribution by a constant and we don't change things because we must have the sums of the probabilities equal to one. That is to say we have a conservation law for probability. Total probability is conserved, which actually imposes tremendous structure on probability distributions. Probability distributions are shift invariant relative to their natural metric because of the conservation of total probability. If we uniformly stretch or shrink our natural metric by multiplying by b, and we assume that there's a conservation of the total value of our natural metric or the average value. That would be to say the total amount of energy is conserved or the average weight of individuals and populations is conserved. And we generally get that because lambda is a parameter which adjusts to describe the mean. Right? So if we multiply by b, we get e to the minus lambda bt. Lambda is just going to adjust for that constant. It's going to drop out. So basically then we get stretch invariance. This is a uniform stretching or shrinking of our natural metric. doesn't change probability pattern. That means that probability pattern is invariant to shift and stretch of our natural metric. Distribution doesn't change. A shift and a stretch is an affine transformation. So I say that probability patterns are affine invariant to their natural metric. So that's a simple description, but the affine invariance then provides us with deep insight because now we have a symmetry group, an affine symmetry group around the natural metric, and that's what's going to give us the structure that unifies basically all common probability patterns. Now, if we have affine invariance, we have the canonical form for probability. If we assume that there exists a, we want to write probability this way, that implies affine invariance. You can go either way, but I like to start with the affine invariance because of these conservation laws. So we have affine invariance for our natural metric. That means that we have a metric T, which is, has some invariance. Now, to understand invariance, what we mean by invariance is always invariant to some underlying transformation. So we can write that. That's a bit like taking a circle, right? If you take a circle and you rotate it by a little bit, it's a circle. And you can apply that rotation over and over again. So if G is rotation and T is a circle, then T relative to the transformation G just leaves us in the circle group. That's the standard way of describing a symmetry group, right? So here we have T relative to some underlying transformation of our observation. If that takes us into an affine form, we don't change the probability pattern. So probability distributions are then invariant to transformations that leave us within this affine group. So we write that notationally as T circle G, T applied to a transformation G, leaves us in the affine group T. That's our symmetry structure that we have to explore. Just to help you in case you're not used to thinking about symmetry groups, we can think of those T and Gs in the following way. Here's a pattern. It's just one I made up. The pattern is a parametric curve describing the distance from the center point. So I just drew a curve. So all of the points on that curve are the distance from the center. If we transform those distances by a power law, so G is a power law transformation, we get something that looks like that. Okay. If we measure those distances on a log scale, we get that form. And after transformation by a power law, if we measure on a log scale, we get that form. So the logarithmic scale is invariant to power law transformations up to affine similarity. Okay, so that's the notion of T is invariant to G. Okay, so T with respect to G, if, if it puts us in the affine group, we don't change the probability pattern because probability patterns are affine invariant. Now, if that's true, then we can apply the G multiple times. That's like rotating a circle. If we rotate it, we can keep on rotating it over and over and over again. So we can apply the transformation N times. We remain within the group. And the key point is we're assuming continuity here in a continuous group. So if we apply an infinitesimal transformation, g to the epsilon, we remain within this affine group. So g to the epsilon we could think of as a generator, which generates the whole group. It's a little transformation that puts us in the affine group. And if we apply that little transformation over and over and over again, we stay in our group. That will expose to us the structure of the symmetry group. So if we apply t to an, to an infinitesimal transformation, that's going to change t by just a little bit. A small change in t we call dt. We can write that as a derivative with respect to some underlying function w, which is a function of the underlying observation z. This is like a parametric derivative. So now we have a little differential equation which describes the symmetry group. 
and it's within this affine form. We solve this differential equation for t, and we get this expression. But because we don't care about multiplying by a constant or shifting by a constant, we can throw out all the terms except for e to the beta w. And we have t is going to be up to affine similarity equivalent to e to the beta the w. And that expresses the affine similarity group for these scaling relations, where w is a shift in variance scale. Because if we add a constant to w, then we just end up multiplying this by a constant. And that doesn't bother us because we're you know, affine similarity. But if we multiply b by a constant, that doesn't work because beta itself is a constant. So, that, so beta w is shift invariant, but not stretch invariant. And beta is the curvature, which describes the departure from, st from stretch invariance. That is to say, if we take w and we stretch it a little bit, we're going to curve t. And the curvature of t is equal to beta. As beta goes to 0, the curvature goes to 0. And so w becomes stretch invariant. So as beta goes to 0, we just recover w is equal to t. But the point is that the affine structure of these scaling relations has this very simple form. OK, so that was perhaps a bit much. But nonetheless, it just comes down to there's a very simple symmetry that comes from affine symmetry. And it gives us this simple structure. That means that canonical probability distributions are e to the minus lambda e to the beta w. That is, in fact, the form of all common probability distributions. I'll talk about that just a little more, and then we'll wrap up. In order to understand this a little more deeply, we have to think about the classic textbook way of describing probability patterns. So this is just a textbook description. We have p of z. That's the probability associated with the observation z. And then we can plot this on some scale here. We can choose the scale, which we just call psi of z. That's called the measure, generally, in probability theory. If we have some observation z that goes to this point, the height is p of z. And the width on this scale is a little incremental width of psi of z. So the probability associated with the event z, again, this is classic probability theory, is going to be p d psi. That's p is the height, and d psi is the width. It's the area of this little rectangle. That's the normal way in probability theory of thinking of continuous probability associated with some number. That means the canonical form for probability distributions is p d psi. e to the minus lambda t is p d psi. And this is our form, which summarizes all probability distributions, where beta is the curvature with respect to w, which is a shift invariant base scale. I'll il illustrate. And psi is typically just z, the thing you're measuring, like age. But in some problems, psi turns out to be t. This would make sense when you're doing an extreme value problem and you need cumulative probabilities. So you're tending to measure things in tail events. Then t would become the basic informative scale. So basically, we have this canonical form for probability distributions. Now, typically, we write things with respect to some observation z, like age, or whatever we're measuring. So if we just take z as what we're typically measuring, then probability distributions have this form, where this psi prime is the derivative of psi with respect to z. So we just change measure from d psi to dz. And this is the form, then, that we see that unifies all probability patterns. Psi, then, again, is typically zw or t, according to the problem. Two examples. If psi is equivalent to z, that just says that the measure on the x-axis is just whatever it is we're measuring, then probability patterns have that form. If we take beta equal 2, that's a curvature. And w is log z, that's our base shift invariant scale. We get this distribution, which is a normal distribution with mean 0 and variance 1 over 2 lambda. If we take psi equals t, which is what we do for extreme value problems, this is the canonical form for all extreme value problems. If we take w equal log z as our base scale, we get a Frechet distribution. This is one of the most commonly observed patterns for any kind of failure problem. How long do jet engines last? Many failure problems have that form. Okay. So we go back to this table of distributions, and then we can make the real tables much bigger, but you can't see it. And we see all of these different stories that we had for all of these different mathematical forms. But in fact, all of them reduced to the canonical forms I showed you relative to a few simple base scales, w, log, or something related to a very similar scale like that. And then we can understand in a unified way the structures of these patterns. And we can also understand the relations between big groups of 
probability distributions. Now we can see the extreme value distributions in a very clear form as it relates to other kinds of distributions. We can see many unrelated forms actually being simple transformations of each other once we see the symmetry structure underlying them. And since most of what we do when we interpret data is interpret probability patterns and scaling relations, this really unifies essentially almost everything we do in terms of interpreting pattern. So summarizing, this is my claim for the canonical form for essentially all continuous probability distributions, where we have beta's curvature, w's a shift in variance scale, and we have some informative measure which will make sense in terms of the problem. All of that arose from, from the conservation of total probability, which we take as given, which gives a shift in variance of a natural metric, and conservation of the total or average value, which is typically quite a reasonable statement. It's not as complicated as the conservation of energy in physics. It's a much more general statement about probability patterns. Together, those give us affine invariance associated with this canonical expression for probability forms. That affine invariance gave us the symmetry group. Once we had this symmetry group, we found that our scaling relations tended to have this form, and that gave us the canonical form, which unified essentially all continuous probability distributions into a simple, nice package. Thank you. central limit theorem in all this, uh, the central limit theorem, how would you, you know, characterize what is accomplishing in terms of this? Uh, yeah, so the question is the central limit theorem. So in relation to this, I mean, the central limit theorem normally gives us the Gaussian or normal distribution, and that, of course, holds. But what I, what I conjecture, but I don't have a proof of, I'm not even close to proving, is that because I showed you, I didn't really go into the Gaussian form I hinted that it was important, but in fact, the Gaussian form represents what we would call rotational invariance or order invariance, and that's the third grade invariance, shift, stretch, and rotation. If you take rotational invariance into account, which means basically order invariance, meaning the order of the observations don't matter, then we can basically unify all continuous probability distributions that are order invariant, as the central limit theorem applying, on the natural metric T. Because for any natural metric T plus order invariance, we get a Gaussian form, that rotational invariance. And the math of that's very pretty. If you ever looked at the normal distribution, and I certainly did when I was a graduate student, and wondered, why is that the most important form? And why does it look, where does that pi come from? <laughs> it's because it's rotational. But it doesn't account for all distributions. I mean, there's some really weird distributions yeah. right, in the sciences. Yeah. Uh, that, and I wonder how those also would play out in terms of if you have a single peak, generally speaking, I think you can put it into my framework. If you have multi-peak distributions, which are usually combinations of underlying processes, then you can have difficulties with what I said. Some of the things I said can be a bit more difficult. But generally speaking, I tend to think of multi-peak distributions as just sort of dual signals. So there's two pure signals, which have simple understanding, and you're, you're just combining them. If you can separate the two signals, you end up with something that's actually fairly simple. That's kind of a speculation. But for, if you just look up most of the distributions you look up in books, in tables, not weird ones, but things that come up, they all pretty much fit this structure in a very simple way. Thank you. Uh, so if you're an experimentalist and you have an experimentally measured distribution, and it doesn't quite fit the gamma distribution. Yes. Say, could, could you fit this general distribution instead of fitting, picking some distribution from the table and trying them? Could you fit the general distribution? Well, you could, except they wouldn't really make it. You're not, this doesn't change. This is, you know, the mathematical equivalences are mathematical equivalences. So the distributions are the same mathematical form, whether you express them in terms of T or in terms of the standard form, right? But I think that the power you get with data is that it calls attention to you thinking about, so a square root transformation is a typical thing you do with data to get a normal distribution. But when I presented the square root transformation, it was much more profound because I was showing you a structure. So when you look at data, um, I think that to me the thing that really comes up, I, I, I don't have time to go into it, but there's one, one example I give when I give this talk, when I give it for more empirically minded. <clears throat> 
talk is I mentioned the distribution of the size of trees. So there was a paper that was published in Science, I think this year or last year, and it talked about the size distribution of trees, and they showed it was a power law with a kind of funny tail, and then they said, well, that's really interesting, and it's true for forests throughout the world, it's amazing, right? And because it's not a normal distribution, they didn't say this, but the way people's minds work, because it's not a normal distribution, I don't have to worry about the central limit theorem and aggregation, so there may be something special is going on. So they told the story about trees, light gaps and growth and so on. I looked at those data and I said, that's linear log linear because patterns like that, growth patterns, always are like that. There's always a little linear piece on the bottom. Things don't grow really slowly. Then there's a growth period that's linear, that's logarithmic. And then there's going to be trees don't grow to the sky. So it kind of levels off. So I, I just wrote down a linear log linear form and without using any statistics or something, I just threw in a couple parameters and I fit the data perfectly in about 15 seconds. Now, if you take that pattern and you plot it on a square root scale, it's a normal distribution. Perfect, normal, the data are perfect normal distribution, which gets to your question. This is in fact the central limit theorem on the linear log linear metric and that trees and forests match normal distributions perfectly. Now if they had submitted that to science, it would have been rejected because the editor would have said, I can't publish a paper that shows that tree sizes are normally distributed. But if they had analyzed the data that way, they would have actually seen the deep structure of the problem. Now, I'm not arguing that trees don't have biology. But what I'm saying is that if you want to understand the biology, you first have to understand the intrinsic geometric constraint of the nature of pattern. If you want to know what's special, you have to know what's generic. Well, yeah, that's so that's my, that's my general that's argument. Kind of the, how to use this machinery to sort of reverse engineer the, something like the process you just run right. through. Say, I, you know, I'm not doing too good a job with my gamma distribution, but I can go into this. Yeah, I, kind of, I think what you want to do is figure out what the, more generally when you think about your problem rather than just looking at the data and trying to fit something. If you just want to look at the data and fit something, then you know, right. use, use a package. But if you want to think about your data, and what it means, then you really have to think about, like sort of the tree sizes. You know, how much of that pattern is, is just the central limit theorem? And how much of it is special? How much of it is different forests differ? And if the different forests differ, why do they differ? You can only answer that question if you can first recognize that there's a certain strong attractor there that's shaping a lot of the structure. I like to think of a snail shell, right? A snail shell, snail shells have this logarithmic spiral. And there's an immense number of different snail shell forms, but they all have the logarithmic spiral. If you don't recognize the logarithmic spiral, then you're gonna have a very hard time understanding snail shells. If you recognize the logarithmic spiral, you can say, okay, there's a logarithmic spiral, but there's also other parameters which determine variation around the theme. So first you have to get the theme, and then you have to get the variation around the theme. I argue that, somewhat cynically, that the vast majority of data analyses are analyzing the generic aspects of pattern and not analyzing the specific aspects that the person who did the study is actually interested in. And that applies to most of data analysis in science. That's my personal view. The, uh, you were talking about several peak, and that it, you know, single peak versus several, and you had the equivalence diagram. You had the keys going down, et cetera, and you didn't finish the bottom on it. But if you had several peaks, I, you know, I'm not going through the mathematics of it, but it sounds like you wouldn't have a one-to-one -one relationship on that team mapping. That yeah, no, you have, to have, um, you have to have monotonicity right. for a lot of these things. But and that would hurt the monotonicity type issue because really what you're having is a, a change of variable type. Right? But name, name a common probability distribution that's multi-peaked. Pardon? Name a common univariate multi-distribution, continuous distribution that's multi-peaked. I mean, it's just not true, you know? <laughs> They're not. They're not multi-peaked. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs>